All right, good morning. Happy uh, happy mid-April to everybody on the Urban Ecology Collaborative call. Um, we are a group of groups in New England, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast um, sort of regions, and we talk about urban forestry about once a month. Uh, we also have a Google group, a listserv, where we can chat about different topics in our field. And um, the goal is to connect researchers and practitioners and get some trees growing in some cities in these regions. So welcome to the, to the meeting, everybody. If you wanna introduce yourselves in the chat, um, your name, your, your pronouns, your organization, where you're calling in from, and um, you know, maybe whether or not you're seeing an early spring like, uh, like some of the rest of us uh, just were discussing. Um, today we're going to be doing a roundtable, so we're going to just be having a, a conversation about a couple different topics, uh, spring and fall plantings, mainly spring, um, if some folks have gotten to their fall plantings and started planning those out, we can talk about that too. Um, we've also heard uh, folks expressing some desire to talk about uh, species selection and nursery stock issues, comments, questions, concerns. Um, we also had heard in a meeting, I think two meetings ago, that folks wanted to talk a little bit about urban wildlife, and then urban forest policy is something that usually comes up anyway, but um, we'll, we'll have some time for that as well. In the past, we've used Google Jamboards um, a couple times to, to do this while we talk, so I'm going to put a link to a Jamboard in the chat. If you're just calling in or you're just listening in, totally okay. You're not required to um, participate in the Jamboard, but... Um, for folks that wanna you know, type some things in on some sticky notes there, I will put the link in the chat um, and I can add that in there a couple more times for people as they join. It does have slides for each of the topics, starting with spring planting, then fall, then the nurseries, then wildlife, then policy. So feel free to add your thoughts in there. Um, I did wanna give a couple minutes for Danielle from the US Forest Service. Um, Danielle emailed to say that she wanted to talk a little bit about some Inflation Reduction Act um, updates, which we're really excited about. So if you're ready, Danielle, um, go ahead and, and take the floor. Yeah, I don't know if you can see me or hear me. Um, my view is very strange, but anyway. I can see you and okay, you. perfect. <laughs> Oh, there I am. Um, so anyway, uh, in case you missed it, um, last week we did release the Notice of Funding Opportunity, also known colloquially as the NOFO, um, for the public facing funds for the Inflation Reduction Act um, for the Urban Forestry Program. Um, Overview, there's one and a half billion dollars um, that is being funneled straight through our program at the Forest Service um, for um, planting and related urban forestry activities, which is really exciting. It's primarily going to be uh, um, uh, focused on underserved communities using uh, the um, White House's Council on Environmental Quality um, tool, CGEST, and I'll put a link in the chat for that so you can start exploring what that looks like. Um, CGEST stands for um, Community and Environmental Climate and economic yes. justice Thank screening you. tool. We got you. I swim in alphabet soup on a regular basis because it is the federal government. So apologies for that, but thank you for the assist, Erica. Um, anyway, um, so it is focused on the underserved communities and primarily will be delivered um, through a competitive grant process. Um, and subgranting processes. Um, the states also did receive $250 million um, uh, uh, distributed in various ways uh, throughout the country. Um, our region, uh, region nine, which is Minnesota to Missouri to Maryland to Maine um, uh, came out really well. And so um, the states will be also issuing their own um, IRA related subgranting program. So keep an eye out for that. Um, the floor of the IRA grants is uh, $100,000 and the ceiling is 50 million. Um, the grants are five-year grants. Um, and so we will continue to um, release funding um, opportunities as the funding gets spent. So if we don't spend the full $1 billion that was announced last week, we will put out another announcement until all that funding is um, awarded. We have to have it spent by the end of the federal fiscal year in 2031. So that is uh, September 30th of 2031. And that means not just allocated, awarded, et cetera, but absolutely spent the projects closed out. 
Um, and so we'll continue to release funding um, as we have them have it available. Um, so I encourage you to go to the national website um, for our program. I'll also put a, a drop a link in the chat um, to go directly to the NOFO. Um, and any questions specific to the public facing NOFO, there is an email address um, where people are, where our Washington office, our national office is addressing any questions that are coming in rather than, um, uh, you know, it's a way of us keeping our messaging consistent throughout the country. So, um, so I just wanted to remind people just in case you missed it, it was a big Big announcement last week in Newark, New Jersey. My colleague Julie Mayhorter was there. I heard it was a really, really great event. So, um, yep, yeah, there we go. Thanks so much, Danielle. Awesome project. We're really excited about all the work y'all are doing and uh, to see how these unfold. Stella, I see your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good morning, everyone. Stella Tarnay from DC here. Uh, we have a small nonprofit, Capital Nature. And uh, Danielle, Probably you have told me how to get my question answered, but let me ask it directly anyway. So, you know, I'm curious how the money is going to be dispersed to local organizations. Like, should we expect to go through like the urban forestry division here in DC through local government or can small nonprofits supply directly for some of those funds? Because we do uh, wonderful neighborhood tree engagement walks, for example, and we'd love to expand those. So it could be both ways. Um, so I would keep an eye, and this is for, for everyone, I would keep an eye out for what the states and DC are releasing for their competitive subgrant programs. And then I encourage you to go to the, the NOFL website um, for eligibility um, and for um, answering a lot of those specific questions to your organization. Um, nonprofits, state, state and local governments, they're all eligible um, to apply. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Read through all of that stuff. There's a lot of really great information. <laughs> um, so daunting, there's uh, a lot, <laughs> I understand. But yeah, I would I would highly recommend that you really read through everything. I think one of the, the biggest challenges are going to be if you don't have an existing SAM registration, which is required for anyone who's doing um, business with the federal government. If you don't have a current registration, it can take up to 45 days. That's the average that was mentioned in the webinar yesterday. Um, that is the average time it takes to get the registration through and you have to have an active registration upon applying. Um, so that is something I want to flag. So if you don't think that you're going to make that, there is also um, a button in uh, um, one of our websites that'll take that'll um, direct you to signing up to um, kind of like almost like a matchmaking service. So like if you you feel like you want to work with someone who's in a local area, we can help um, connect you to those people as well. Sounds good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and one last thing. When I mentioned the webinar, those webinars filled up capacity super fast. Um, and so those um, webinar recordings, if you didn't make it into the registration um, ahead of time, they are closed. So um, don't worry. They are being posted. The recordings are being posted um, pretty fast for us. Um, so keep an eye out for that as well. Awesome, Danielle. I was going to ask about when they were going to be posted because I didn't get to go and I was like, oh, I really want to be there. But um, yeah, thanks for posting those uh, recordings. And uh, it was really clear like where they were going to be too. I really liked that. So um, good. yeah, I can't wait to watch and, and, uh, and listen in for those. All right. So um, I will put the link to the Jamboard in the chat again, just for anyone who wants to kind of write rather than talk, but um, let's go right into it. Um, if folks want to raise their hands in Zoom or just come off mute, we have kind of a small group, so you can just unmute yourself if you if you feel like it, um, or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. But uh, let's, let's talk about spring tree planting season. Um, does anyone have any kind of overview of what they're doing this spring that they'd like to start off sharing? Um, I can start if that's all right. Yeah, go yeah, ahead, so, Eric. Thanks. Yeah, so hi, everybody. I'm uh, Eric Fischel, the Forest Program Manager over at Baltimore Green Space. Um, and one of the really interesting things that I think we are doing um, over here is um, we are actually doing an edge planting at one of our forests that we work with um, as a design to see 
what low lying, not necessarily trees, but perennials and um, shrubs and other things that can go on the edge of the forest, but not necessarily be intrusive and create a welcoming edge. Um, what things can do well there. Um, and also which things um, are, which management practices, which uh, preparation practices and all of that good stuff um, would be best for getting plants in on the edge. That's awesome. That's a really cool, I love that you're considering more than just the trees. I'm actually kind of in the same boat, Eric. Um, I am doing this spring um, a Miyawaki forest, and it's actually in between two areas of like remnant woodland as well. So kind of closing a forest gap using the Miyawaki method. Um, I don't know how familiar folks are. It's it's kind of like a, it's been in the news a bunch, different, different areas. Um, Miyawaki forest being coming from the botanist, Japanese botanist Akira Miyawaki, who kind of um, discovered or, I mean, I guess you don't really discover forest succession, but he did a lot of work on how to kind of accelerate forest succession and kind of the, the concept is planting climax canopy trees, some fast growing pioneer tree species, um, some understory trees, some shrubs and some perennials so that you have kind of vertical kind of stratification um, and you're kind of adding to what's there to accelerate the forest succession uh, process. And you plant those trees pretty densely. So like three trees per square meter or, or, or more. And you can actually install these Miyawaki forests, also sometimes called micro forests, mini forests. Um, they can be as small as, I've seen one company saying they can be as small as six parking spaces. So you can do relatively small areas and kind of jumpstart um, restoration to a natural area in the future. So I'm gonna be doing one of those this this spring and we'll see how it goes. Um, we, we might also touch back on that with the urban wildlife because I used to be a bird bander and I would love to understand how um, these forest replantings, especially that edge stuff, Eric, um, my study that I worked on was actually in transmission line rights of way, which essentially function as edge habitat everywhere they are. Um, and I was studying how migratory songbirds use those throughout all seasons, not just the breeding season. And uh, I think we could study Milwaukee forests. I think we could study wildlife in Milwaukee forests very easily. So, well, I, I'm glad I'm glad that we've put a name to this style of planting. Um, and only because back in back in the 90s, I remember the Department of Transportation in Houston doing the same thing in interchange. They call it the Green Ribbon Project. They've planted a million trees using this method, but landscape architects and forest urban foresters kind of got in a, a little bit of a tiff over the spacing issue. Hey, you're wasting money planting them this densely, but there was a very specific purpose purpose of occupying that site with canopy quickly to keep invasive species and noxious weeds under control using a natural method rather than just herbicide, herbicide, herbicide all the time. So they were actually looking at reducing mowing costs. And Eric, I, I love the edge idea as well. Occupy the space with the thing you want, and you're less likely to have the other invasive problems, perhaps. It's worth testing. Yeah, and that's the way we're designing. We're definitely designing it as an experiment. Um, and also to your point, Erica, I'm also a, a bird bander. I'm currently doing bird banding here in Baltimore. Um, so we do have a lot of cool research going on about uh, bird usage of um, urban green spaces all around Baltimore. That's amazing. I'm definitely going to have to 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 connect with you somehow, somewhere, because um, yeah, I think we we need to be doing up here in Boston. We we don't really uh, we have a, a DCR staff person who's honestly incredible. His name's Sean Riley. He um he set up his own bird banding station at the Belle Isle Marsh. So they're doing migratory songbirds, but he's also doing raptor research. So he catches the raptors and everything. And I just think it's so cool. So yeah, thanks for sharing. That's so cool. We'll have to connect, Eric. I also will say that related to using rights of way, Erica, your if your background is is transmission rights of way, you know the the right of way stewardship group holds a, a conference every year, and I think the utility industry is actually you know really values um, converting those spaces to more environmentally friendly spaces. 
for birds, pollinators, et cetera, but also to reduce costs and the use of herbicides. Yeah, yeah. Back when I was studying these types of things, um, I was in Maine and New Hampshire more so. And in Maine, they were doing integrated pest management. So they were actually doing backpack sprays of tree species. Um, and they were trying to, like the whole logic was to promote blueberry and alder and things that weren't ever going to get within their zone their clearance zone. And I was working with a really great utility forester from Eversource. Um, it was slightly harder to get in with National Grid. So I didn't have any um, sites in Massachusetts at the time. I am Massachusetts based now, um, but I did see a really big difference, like just being out there every day in the the um, IPM sites and, and the, or the IVM. It would be vegetation, not pests. Yeah, um, the integrated vegetation management sites. I did see a big difference in what was coming back um, versus the New Hampshire sites, which were only mechanically mowed, and those had to be mowed every three years. So they would come out with a brontosaurus, and it was very intense. Um, but the uh, the main sites were a lot different. So yeah, I'm glad to hear that there's a conference there. Um, there is a conference, the Trees and Utilities Conference. There, there's now an environmental track within that conference. And that is all vegetation managers. Um, that's going to be in Pittsburgh this fall. So, you know, that that's another place where I think environmental issues can be brought forth because they, they're mostly the utilities are looking for ways to cut costs, but there are some great crossover benefits to that. And you know, for urban wildlife, for you know, wildlife on these corridors, it can be critical. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and add a little sticky note to the to the Jamboard in the urban wildlife section about this. Anybody else on the line want to talk about their spring planting plans? Well, I I'll jump in just to maybe amplify my note that I sent to this group about the Arbor Day Foundation and our interest in tree supply. And so my question is, here it is April, are we scrambling to find the trees we want? And I, I got a couple of responses, but um, I, I would say that, you know, our interest is typically in a, a smaller statured tree, uh, uh, not, not by species, but the physical product. We look at maybe seven, five gallon, three gallon, and one gallon, because to some extent we're shipping these around to our customers, whether it's a community canopy program uh, that is sponsored in a city or town or by a utility, or we're shipping by mail uh, for customers that are try buying those products online. And of course, you know, we struggle finding trees, even with our network of growers. And one of the questions, one of the, so the responses I got sort of indicated that it is a challenge to find native species of the caliper size required for the planting project. This one and a half to two and a half inch diameter or caliper, however we're measuring that product, takes a long time to grow and, and we don't see the, the diversity of species in the marketplace, at least not with the growers that might be in a particular area. And I think you know our what we're trying to do is gather a lot more information about what is the supply chain and can can we do some contract growing? And I would be curious to know if other groups now are pursuing a local contract grow to get that two inch tree. Yeah, Pete, I didn't send anything in to you, but I can definitely talk about my experience. I went to about 12 nurseries last week just to go. I don't want to be, um, I work for Mass Audubon, so it's an environmental nonprofit that's statewide. I really want to go see the nursery and meet who I'm going to be working with, especially as we start to kind of ramp up planting seasons each year. Um, I'd really like to learn more about how they work. And my experience was, number one, I don't know if it's because I'm a younger person or just how I present myself and how I just show up unannounced. That's not always everyone's favorite thing, especially during the busy season for them, which is now um, in, in our area. Um, 
but I was finding that it's very hard if you're new to figure out where to get plants. And I'm getting the sense that it's hard for everyone, but um, I was feeling like, okay, as a new person to like find plants, buy plants, get them to where they need to go. It's really hard to like, no one really has time for that conversation. So I'm glad that we're gonna have that conversation kind of here amongst um, the folks in this room. Um, the company I'm most interested in working with right now is Native Plant Trust. Um, they just had their opening day at Garden in the Woods in Framingham, and they have all of the native species that I'm looking for. For the Miyawaki Forest, one of the things that I that I really like about it is that I am looking for smaller stature products. Like I am looking for like three gallon, five gallon, like probably the biggest trees that will go in for that project are like seven gallon trees, but it's 350 plants. So I'm doing this dance of like, I need to get the order in, but the place is open to the public now. So plants are leaving the site and they may run out. Um, how do you set up the tax exemption certificates and make sure you have a trade account with these smaller companies that don't necessarily, I mean, no. Native Plant Trust knows how to do this, but um, like, it's slow, right? You can't just go and, and leave. Um, I also don't have a truck, so I have modified my Honda CRV to be a tree transportation vehicle, which is a little bit extra, I would say, but um, you do what you have to, right? To 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 get the plants and 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 do the thing. So yeah. um I was definitely finding that the suppliers that are trade only, um, that are that are kind of getting large trees and then giving those to other places like Home Depot or giving them to the other nurseries, those folks are very like abrupt, like come in with your question and have your specific question and then like leave. Um, Here's my price. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, even that, um, they knew that I wasn't really the the, the customer they're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> they're looking to fill tractor trailers, not Honda CRVs. Well, so, um, Erica, I mean, it, it points out the challenge of the small buyer, mm -hmm. right? And I think for native plants in in a traditional urban project, you know, we're trying to increase diversity, which means we want a lot of different species, but not very many of each. And that is a problem that we, tr we, we really need to solve. And I think the only way we're gonna be able to influence the marketplace is by pooling either resources or orders and trying to you know, coordinate a year in advance. I, I, that is the hardest thing. I think from our perspective, we would love to influence the supply a year or two ahead, even if we don't have buyers for these trees and then release those to places like you folks in the Northeast or other places. Um, you know, we're, we're doing like you're doing, vetting the grower and, and trying to develop a relationship and that might start with buying, but it does start with the dialogue. So I really encourage what you're doing and try to pool. Maybe it's Massachusetts nonprofits that are buying five trees at a time and say, okay, what's our real order? Yeah, that's a great tip. And, uh, you know, I've kind of, I've been hearing about urban tree nurseries becoming like kind of this thing. And Boston did have an urban tree nursery kind of along the banks of actually this site that I'm at today for a while, but it, it disappeared over time. Um, it, and so it's a hard keeping... thing to manage a nursery. It really does require a level of expertise that not everyone has. I think Tree Pittsburgh may be one of the most successful. Megan. I would love to hear. Yeah, I see Megan is on the call. Um what can you tell us yeah. about tree nurseries, Megan? Sure. Yes, I'd love to share. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Megan from Tree Pittsburgh, and I run our tree nursery. Um, so Tree Pittsburgh, I think a lot of you are familiar with us, but we're an urban forestry nonprofit in Pennsylvania. And um, we've been around since 2006. So uh, early on in our you know, work, we were really struggling to find the appropriate plant material, as many of you are mentioning. Um, so we decided to start our own nursery and it did take time and it was a slow process, but we started small um, with just a $5,000 sprout fund grant. And that helped us just um, start a small little fledgling nursery um, for our own usage. So we were just collecting seed from heritage trees, which is what we call them. Basically trees that are growing in Western PA that are really strong parent trees of species that we were looking for and then propagating the seed. Like it actually started on like the back patio of our office and then <clears throat> moved on to um, 
an urban lot, a vacant site. So um, that was great for our own use. And then the program kind of got some interest from partnering nonprofits as well. So for example, Parks Conservancies, Land Trusts, groups that are doing restoration in the area, they were also having the same problem sourcing material. So um, at that point, we kind of made a business plan to expand the nursery um, and we acquired funding to move on to a larger two acre site to start actually growing bulk tree material of the species that all these groups were also looking for. So um, today we grow about 20,000 containerized trees a year. Um, most of them are grown from seed um, that are collected here in Western Pennsylvania mm -hmm. because you know we really want that locally adapted, genetically diverse plant material, which is what we're looking for in these restoration plantings. Um, we grow, usually it's two to three gallon sized plant material or size stock, mostly because when we're doing plantings with volunteers that has, we've kind of narrowed in on the size that is most manageable for groups. And, you know, as you were mentioning, a lot of our partners and customers, they don't have big vans or pickup trucks. They're coming with their work vehicle or their personal vehicle. So they'll get 10 trees at a time or something and they can fit several in their vehicle. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what we're doing right now. And our um, nursery, about half of the material we grow is used by Tree Pittsburgh for our projects, whether it's tree giveaways, a tree adoptions or restoration. And the other half is um, basically sold or partnered um, with other organizations that do the planting. So right now I'm really working to get plant lists as much as possible um, in advance so that I can try and custom grow the material that our partners are looking for. Yeah. It doesn't always work out because you know you never know what kind of funding is gonna come down the line and spring is the time when we kind of need to know that information. So for example, you know, with the IRA funding, nobody really knows what they're gonna get. So generally speaking, I ask our partners, have you put in any requests for tree funding? And is it riparian? Is it upland? What species would you be looking for? <clears throat> and that helps me plan the crops for the coming year. Um, but generally speaking, I, I grow about 80 species, 90 now species of native trees and shrubs, and I try and do a mix of riparian, upland, and urban species that are tolerant of like salt, um, heat island effect, air pollution, that kind of stuff. Um, so, so Megan, yeah. did, you, did you attend the Forest Service webinar this last week, I think? On, no, Danielle, uh, Danielle was on that call. Uh, so I was not, uh, no, I did not participate in that. Well, I, I, you know, what you're, you're doing sort of part of what these geneticists uh, in Texas have been doing for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And that is you're finding good specimens to collect seed from. These are regular seed producers, they're reliable, you know where they are, you're allowed to collect seed from them, and then you're using that seed. And what they've really done and almost perfected is a model of testing. Are, are those trees suited to some of the places that you know, we're planting? In? And as your nursery may grow, it may be useful to tag or keep track of where those trees are get planted so you can sort of see the performance of that tree because ultimately what they do is build seed orchards. And mm -hmm. those orchards for those species are able to really generate quite a bit more seed and, and ramp up production for at least liner stock. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, method, but you know, if we're not monitoring some of the genetics of where we're putting trees, we can't really look at, are those truly well adapted? In Texas, you're looking at a Schumard oak planted in an urban environment in Fort Worth 40, 50 years ago that they're collecting seed from and now distributing that seed around. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and is it a proven winner or just a survivor? And uh, right. it's an interesting pattern. I, I would encourage you to go to that webinar, take a look. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we're doing that on a smaller scale, I would say, because we've planted so many thousands of trees over the past 15 mm -hmm. years here in Pittsburgh. We're at the point where we can now collect seed from some of the trees we planted, you know, 10 years ago or so. 
Um, and it's, it's interesting to see how our trees respond to some of the climate changes that we've been experiencing. So we had a really, really warm spring here as well. A lot of the non-natives are just like well out, you know, into leaf, but our native oaks and some of our hardwood species that we've collected from seed are still closed. So that's really helpful because last night we had a hard frost and <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of the That's things exactly that are right. not necessarily native to this area got toasted. It may not be change, it's variability. The climate variability is getting worse. And, and that alone means we want to protect what we're planting. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, it's it's been really interesting to grow out our nursery. And I think there's a lot of room for growth. And, um, you know, it's also a model that other nonprofits in different regions could explore but it's helped us significantly to have our own tree nursery yeah. because this type of specialized plant growing is something that you can't really find, you know, in most cities. You're going to be getting stock that is grown in the Pacific Northwest or down south that is not necessarily adapted to the area. But not only that, it's they're generally speaking, genetically all very similar to one another. So if a threat, a future threat comes into the forest, they'll all be kind of susceptible to that if one is going to be impacted so I, I think your 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 role in population genetics and and promoting that in in the plantings is really valuable mm -hmm. because the cultivar strategy could be a real problem moving forward it's right. it's hard to plant enough cultivars to get diversity mm -hmm. um so I, I really encourage you to keep keep that up but i i guess i'd be remiss if i didn't also mention casey trees nursery They've got a pretty big facility in Virginia now. And if anyone's going to the World Forum on Urban Forests, I think there'll be a tour of that facility. So I encourage you to think about the World Forum this fall in Washington, D.C., and, and then trying to maybe get on that tour. Registration is yeah. open. So just one final thing, you know, at this point, I, I'm really curious as to what species and what sizes groups are looking for. You know, I think whatever all of you are looking for would also be true for our region as well. So I'm doing a little bit more research on where the future of our nursery is going. So I'd be interested to hear like uh, what species and sizes are difficult to find in your areas. Thank you so much, Megan. It's so nice to hear that you're start that you started a nursery and that this can be done in other places, and also that it kind of started on a patio. I actually have been like propagating trees from seeds that I like found in the park in my backyard. <laughs> and I'm hoping that that will become something, but maybe it won't, but maybe it will. We don't know. And yet, I'll just so. throw out there. Somebody <laughs> mentioned the, the um, is it the wild seed project? Yeah, that was me. Uh, uh, love their yeah, resources. So she's great at her whole ethos is demystifying tree growing from seed it is so much easier than you would think. Um, so it, you know, I highly encourage people to start growing their own trees. You could just literally collect the seed and throw them in a pot in the fall, leave them outside all winter and they'll sprout. So, um, check out that, uh, check out that group if you can, the wild seed project. Absolutely. So, so awesome. I, I love their resources. And um, in terms of selecting plant species for this year, um, the Miyawaki method. So this whole thing that I've been just doing personally, um, it, it recommends that you go and look for what's already on the site and then try to like match that. But I'm working on a site that was a brownfield. So there's nothing, there was no trees here like 80 years ago, but 75 years ago, a bunch of stuff kind of came up. So um, I'm thinking about like, well, what species should we be planting? And a lot of what I'm thinking of personally right now is um, about like biodiversity issues. So we, in Boston, we had our street tree inventory completed um, and it came out with our urban forest plan at the end of 2022. And looking at that, um, honey locust is our most common street tree. We don't have the data for all the park trees and we don't have data on private property, but right now we're working um, on a private land tree canopy project that's gonna be a few years in the, in the running. And um, for that, like the types of species are going to have to be um, you know, suitable for private landowners' needs and wants as well. I think it's better personally if a private landowner is going to want to plant something, even if that's not like the strict native, like 
exact tree that we would ultimately want. Um, I think the, the Green in the Gateway Cities program in Massachusetts has found that if you get people interested in trees and maybe you're planting, you know, something that's shorter stature or it is a cultivar first, you can actually increase people's ability like desire and appetite for native trees um, after they see the success of maybe that that first couple of trees going in. So I'm thinking about, you know, different projects requiring different species. So the microforest project, a lot of small stuff, a lot of different species. So not not um, not too many of one plant, like 10 of each plant is the maximum for that project. But then for the um, for the private land plantings, it's going to be like what's going to look beautiful in someone's yard, maybe fit with above and below ground conflicts, but also like, do we have anything native for that? Um, and then Zoe, I see, I'm going to read your, your comment in the chat out loud. I see that you have to go, um, but thanks so much. And I'll just, I'll, I don't want this Baltimore, Baltimore Tree Trust Plant, uh, post to go unnoticed and because of the recording folks won't be able to to hear this um, so i'll just read this um, baltimore tree trust plans to plant 6,000 trees in 2023 majority of them are two to two and a half inch bald and burlapped for street trees they are partnering with the baltimore city uh, department of recreation and parks who order many of the trees from various nurseries they have an operations manager who's an expert here and sent um, the response to, I think, Pete's question. So for tree procurement, um, the issue is usually size. Getting two inch caliber trees or larger has been an issue because a lot of buyers are willing to settle for smaller. So the growers don't have to have the stock hanging on and, and they don't they don't have to keep it and grow it out to that robust size. It's especially the case with native flowering understories like red buds and dogwoods, and they're pivoting to use more corn beams. So that's great to hear from Baltimore Tree Trust. Um, one of my things that I've been thinking about with this is the the um and I'm curious if others have been thinking about this, the idea that when you plant a larger tree, it adds time to the soil establishment of those roots. So I've seen a, di a, uh, a diagram somewhere and I'll try to <laughs> dig up the source and send it out. But for every caliber inch you increase at time of planting, it takes an additional one and a half years for those roots to integrate into the soil. So in my perspective, I would rather plant something smaller um, personally, because I want to see those plants establish into the soil and not kind of reject from that. But what are what are others thoughts on that? I, I think the research would bear that out. Um, um, Mike Arnold in Texas did a study years ago now that was funded by the tree fund that showed five gallon trees catch up to 15 and larger, four, I think 45 gallon trees within three years. That was a, only a handful of species um, in a warmer climate. But yeah, I think I, I think from an investment return you know, ratio, that smaller tree can be pretty valuable to, they both require essentially the same amount of care and, and maintenance over the first couple of years to get them growing, but uh, that smaller tree is going to take off and certainly easier to plant correctly. Um, I, I think that, <clears throat> you know, one of the challenges for some of our native species and getting the nursery industry to, in, to do them and get them to say a two inch caliper is that they grow a little slower. And the nursery, th this is one of the barriers that I identified in another study that Andrew Kozer led out of, out of the University of Florida and, and really talked about what are the barriers to the nursery industry responding to demand. And one of them is, if we're growing this tree now for three, four more extra years, then can we charge enough at the end of that to recoup our, our, our time? Or our space in our nursery. And so I think we've got to put some pressure on the, the, the entities that are ultimately owning these trees. If it's Baltimore Parks and Rec or street trees to say, you know, can we relax that two inch requirement for these species in order to get diversity? Can we relax that particular standard? What's so sacrosanct about two and a half inches caliper. Show me the, the you know, I, what is the real, the, the complaint I hear is vandalism. 
but a two and a half inch tree can be vandalized just as easily as a smaller tree. So again, the protection regime that you need is virtually the same regardless of size. I know one of the things the nursery industry would like to see is payment based on the age of the product they're selling, not the size. Did it take five years to grow in the nursery? Three years, two years, six months, <laughs> because that might, maybe it isn't about size and maybe what you're buying is, you know, we want a five-year-old tree and size is less relevant. And now you can get that native tree grown because the nursery then knows what they can charge and, and how much time it's going to take. Yeah, I would say we struggle with that challenge in, the, in our nursery because, uh, like, for example, a white oak is the same price as a catalpa. Now, the catalpa took like eight months to get to that size, whereas the white oak took four or five years. Right. But you know, when we try to charge more for those species, then we see people right. purchasing the less valuable, I don't want to say valuable, but not as much diversity goes into their plantings. So we are kind of hoping it evens itself out, um, you know, a little bit of the catalpas, a little bit of the oaks um, to even out the, the prices, but it's hard to charge more for those older trees. And, and that's what's great about your experience, Megan, is you are experiencing the pressures of the marketplace as a nursery. And mm -hmm. that, that's going to give you the best understanding of anybody about how to not only grow product, but price product, mm -hmm. move it out there. It's nice that you've got some, some nonprofit partners that, that are going to want that demand no matter what and have smaller stock. And mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's sort of where the Arbor Day Foundation is, but if there's a way we can support you, anybody on the call, we're, we're really open to thinking about how to do that. Yeah, I'm seeing in the chat too, Danielle, thanks for that. Um, New York City Parks landed on two and a half inch caliber trees over years of trial and error on what will survive there and cost efficiencies. Yeah. It's New York City specific. Thanks for making that, that point. But I, I do wonder, I think for the street trees, like if they're in street tree pits, there is some utility in like the person abutting, like knowing that it's there and caring about it as a larger tree. That's what I see a little bit in the environmental nonprofit space, like working on a couple of different ones. Um, like the folks who aren't like the arborists or the urban foresters who are working there, like they really want to see, see an impact. And when you plant a smaller tree, it kind of is like, oh, well, that's kind of, that looks like kind of wimpy. Like we want something that looks like a looks like a tree. So I think there's some like kind of sociology, like visual things of like, maybe if you do plant that bigger tree, the abutting neighbor who could adopt that tree. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> stealing plants too. Um, that's a size where they can't really wrench it out of the ground and steal it. Um, I have seen on some, some state owned properties, we had an article from, I think it was either last summer, I think it was last summer, where someone took a machete to some of the two inch caliber trees inside the, the pit. So it's like, do we want people to know there's a tree there so that they steward it more? Do we want them not to know there's a tree there because they might take it or? Um... And I think, I think what you touched on, Erica, though, is that engagement of that adjacent owner, that that alone about them knowing or maybe choosing the species allows perhaps a smaller tree, that there is someone watching and tending. Um, you know, they, we had a, a machete incident here too in Lincoln, and it does happen. Uh, I mean, there, there are vandals out there. I, I would suggest, however, that compared to the population of trees we're planting, it's small. Totally, totally agree. Um, so we are at 1047. I wanted to know if anyone on the call wanted to talk about urban wildlife or policy. Um, I did put in the Jamboard for the policy section that I was just sent over. Um, Somerville, Massachusetts created a native tree ordinance. I had a lot of feelings about seeing that title, but then when I read the article, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, and then Boston is actually working on a tree protection ordinance. We don't have one um, right now. Uh, we just have the, the chat 
chapter laws that that get followed. Um, but we do have a city councilor who's proposed a tree ordinance, and I think that um, there's been some involvement of some urban foresters in trying to like review the draft because it was a copy and paste of Somerville's tree protection ordinance. And mm -hmm. if anyone knows Boston, Boston doesn't really do cut and paste. <laughs> um, so and and it wouldn't work for our city. Our city is different. So. Um, you know, just just trying to work with with the political side of things to get a tree protection ordinance that uh, facilitates urban foresters work and actually helps grow our tree canopy is something we're thinking about right now. And I thought the native tree planting ordinance was an interesting um, topic. We also have two bills at the state level in Massachusetts. One of them is called the Re Municipal Reforestation bill and then there's another one i forget the name right now but um there's a lot of legal stuff going on so any anybody on the call have strong feelings about um whether we talk about urban wildlife or the policy ordinances um folks who haven't who haven't spoken yet um any thoughts about anything we've talked about i'll just leave some time for people to join in I want to point out that the Morton Arboretum and the Chicago Region Tree Initiative did put out a new tool for developing ordinances, tree protection or tree preservation ordinances um, that could be very useful as a way to sort of build. It's using, you know, code from Illinois, but uh, I think that the principles are pretty applicable everywhere if Boston is in that process. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, hi. Hi, this is John O'Neill from Urban Forestry Division in Washington, D.C. Um, my main job is uh, enforcing our city's uh, special tree, we'll call the special tree law, but our uh, tree ordinance uh, has been in effect since 2002. Uh, I have a lot of uh, knowledge about what uh, what would be, I think what's worked and what hasn't for us over that time. Um, I'd be interested to see like what the what the Boston law looks like or what's proposed in Boston. Does that, is it mainly um, attempting to preserve uh, or I guess preserve like private trees on private property? Is it? It's both. So it's it's public and private property. And that's been one of the places of debate so far is, um, you know, like, should it be kind of, uh, I think people have been saying the word bifurcated. I'm like, I don't know what that is. Like, let's just say, do you mean split in two? Like, I think, I think people are, are meaning that. Um, so yeah, it is supposed to cover both. Um, we've had community members asking for a tree cutting moratorium, right? So folks in the neighborhoods that want no tree to be cut anymore until this ordinance is passed. Um, there's a lot of different complicated things. We have really high, I mean, a lot of places, a lot of cities have really high development pressure, um, but we, we have this kind of um, alliance for, for uh, private tree canopy planting and maintenance. That's more focused on new trees. And this ordinance is supposed to maybe help um, add some protections to those older trees that we're losing at a really, really fast rate. So, so it is both. Um, I'm, I'm super interested to hear about the special tree law. Can you tell us more about that, John? That would be awesome. Yeah, of course. Uh, so um, it's been amended over the years, but at the beginning, it, uh, it created a size class of trees uh, over 44 inches circumference. It uses circumference for some reason, um, but that's you know 14 inches DBH and um, trees over that size are protected. They're called special trees in the District of Columbia. And uh, to remove a, a special tree, you need, um, you need to get a permit and to get the permit, you need a, to pay a fee into the city's tree fund um, uh, to remove the tree if it's hazardous. There's of course, or sorry, non-hazardous. There's of course exemptions if the tree is hazardous, if it's uh, one of a number of, um, a small number of exempt species uh, or, um, you know, there was initially an exemption too for government actors, although that was changed uh, just over the summer uh, because it, it was acknowledged that you know the government was one of the worst offenders of, of the you know canopy removal. Um, so Washington D.C. has a, a huge federal government presence; they're still exempt, um, but you know D.C. municipal government itself uh, now has to 
uh, kind of obey the special and heritage tree laws. Um, uh, another thing it did in, in 2016 is it made another size class uh, called heritage trees. Those are trees over 100 inches circumference, uh, uh, 31.9 inches DBH or more. And they um, those have extra protections where you can't pay to remove the tree, uh, even if it's um, if, if it's non-hazardous. So the only way to remove it basically is if it's hazardous or um, exempt. Uh, that is if it's an exempt species. So um, that's kind of the the basics of it. Um, one thing that I don't again not having seen the Boston proposal, uh, one thing we used to do was uh, instead of paying into the tree fund to remove these non-hazardous species from private property, you could uh, plant trees. You, know, you could you know, do a planting in lieu of, of a payment. And that really did not work. Um, I, I, I don't recommend it. Uh, I, I haven't seen the sample. Um, I haven't seen the sample uh, ordinances that you mentioned either, uh, Pete. But uh, uh, so I don't know if they they say that or not. But um, well, I, I'd say it is it is common. If anyone's doing cut and paste, you're going to end up with a mitigation ordinance that allows planting in lieu of the the funding part. I, I just had that discussion here in Lincoln, and their city attorneys are saying that's not even legal here. And I go, well, you know, it is. You just don't want to do it. But uh, you know, I I think. DCs is you, you've hit on some really key points about what is actually protecting canopy, and and it's 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 as hard in DC as anywhere in the country. So, you know they're they're trying their best. It's it sounds like the DC has landed where Round Rock, Texas is. They've got that same sort of certain sizes may not be removed under any circumstances. You gotta change the building. You gotta, you gotta make other accommodations. Others are then mitigated. Uh, 10 for one sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's inch for inch of diameter. Sometimes it's inch for inch or square inch for square inch of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, essentially basal area. And uh, all of those are hard to actually implement. Most developers say, yeah, I'll plant 10 for one. I'll plant five for one. I'll negotiate one for one if I can. And, you know, that gets down to the politics, less of the, the science. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, John and Pete. Um, really good to hear about that. I've been researching other ordinances across the United States, and um, the Society of Municipal Arborists had Naomi Rochamel from Austin, Texas, speaking about the 40-year-old Austin ordinance the other week. I don't know, a month. I don't really know <laughs> anymore. Time is flying. And um, I highly recommend like watching that, catching up with that. Um, it really has to do with like people in the city being on board with protecting and um, protecting trees. And I want to just, we have like four minutes left, so I'm trying to cover a lot of topics today. Um, and I see that Ali um, has a background in urban wildlife ecology and newer to urban forestry. So we are a pair, Ali. Um, be interested to, le to learn from this group about urban wildlife and if wildlife is considered when making management decisions. Heard a bit about birds early in the call. Are other types of species considered? And then I see that Sarah, Rudolph said that definitely white-tailed deer are in, are something in urban environments that are considered many municipalities trying to manage overabundant deer to, to due to absence of predators and inability to discharge firearms, hunt, etc. Um, I can definitely say that at Mass Audubon, we are um, our mission is to protect the nature of Massachusetts for people and wildlife. So we are thinking about wildlife, both um, herbivory resistance of tree species sometimes when we're planting in a high herbivory area and um, also in terms of what gets supported by the different environments we're working on. Um, we do a lot of wetland restorations as well, which is less the urban forestry side. Um, and we, we definitely think about this. Um, I saw a paper about how arborists consider wildlife that is in the literature and I'll send out a link to that um, in the follow up to this call because I thought that was interesting and wanted to give that a read and then I heard about fox squirrel damage to trees in I don't know if it was Iowa maybe it was Iowa um, but I know we don't really have fox squirrels here in Boston but I was curious if anyone else has fox squirrel problems <laughs> um, and then I see Stella's hand again so go ahead Stella. 
Oh, thanks. Uh, multiple thoughts, deciding which one to, to speak. Uh, John, uh, hello from DC. Uh, I look forward to meeting you at some point. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that we have found, and I'm wondering, uh, John, and those of you that are considering ordinances have thought about is, you know, it seems like some of the developers, many of them are trying to do the right thing. You know, they'll preserve the heritage tree on a redevelopment site, but then there's going to be so much heavy construction around the roots of that tree. There's one site in Tacoma um, that a group of us are talking about where just like 500 units of, of um, housing are going in around that one tree that's being preserved. And so maybe there's a follow-up question to those of you who actually work in this issue directly is what are the what are the odds of a heritage tree that is being preserved there's a fence around it there's a sign um but with all of that activity what percentage of them actually survive so that would be one question for us to consider at some point and the other is that going back to our neighborhood tree walks and wildlife which is really like a sweet spot for me I have found that giving those neighborhood tree tours is a is an incredible segue to talk about urban wildlife because we'll start talking about the 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 walking sticks and the moths and the butterflies that start their lives in the tree. And then we talk about the cycle and about the importance of the, the leaf cover on the, on the ground and how that connects to bird life and insect life and, and mammals. So I just want to kind of put a shout out to trees as, as, as one of the ways to help people enter conversations about urban wildlife. And I think there's a lot more that we could do with that. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're modeling it out in DC, but I'd love to hear other people's experiences with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, my title here at Mass Audubon is urban ecologist, not really urban forester. So I'm super excited to hear that people want to go in these directions and kind of like just how some species of trees, native trees can be keystone species in that habitat. Like how can urban forestry be a keystone concept for people to really understand more about the nature of cities and the nature in cities and like that it's not just trees or just wildlife it's all kind of a system that um, relies on soil i'm so interested in soil right now i've been seeing a lot of stuff about about soil um kind of go a little bit less talked about um and i think that all of our ecosystems and keystone like everything comes up out of soil. <laughs> um, and yeah, I don't know, I'm kind of diverting things here, but uh, I think you're talking about urban ecology, Stella, and I think that's great. And I love going on walks like that, like just as, even as an urban forester, like more experienced working in this field, like you just see people asking questions and um, saying things that it's like, wow, you really are an urban ecologist in your neighborhood and your lived experience is reflecting that you know how these things are connected. You just might not have the species names that we can provide. So, um, you know what awesome. we did, just, yeah, just a quick uh, return. So our last walk was in Eckington, which is a very urbanized neighborhood in DC. And we actually had Robert, um, uh, God, John, what is Robert's last name? Robert Carlotta. Oh, yeah, who Robert Carlotta. Uh, Oh, Carletta, oh. thank you. Walk with us. And so actually it was very effective because I was kind of holding up the storytelling. So I would talk about Willow Oak being Thomas Jefferson's favorite tree and, you know, the way birds love certain berries and, you know, great fun stories about bears and, and uh, uh, black gums. And people were really digging that. But on the other hand, Robert was also really passing on really interesting information about the care of the trees. And we talked about mulch. And the kind of back and forth between like his deep knowledge and then the stories, I think, I think it worked very well. So maybe that's something we'd like to do more of in the future. Absolutely amazing. Um, thanks so much, everybody. We are over time. I'm sorry about that, but it's so exciting to always have these round tables and um, you know, I, I think there's just a lot, a lot here. We tried to do a lot of concepts today. Um, in May, we're going to have Drew Powell come and speak um, from, from, I think, uh, what's UMCB? It's Baltimore, um, but it's a university in Baltimore. Drew has it's been University studying. of Maryland, Baltimore County. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Um, so we're, we're excited to welcome Drew to talk about um, his research. And uh, let's keep the conversation going. The email list that we have is a Google group. So um, if you're not receiving the emails, feel free to go to our website, www.urbanecologycollaborative.com. Um, dot com and you can sign up to be part of our Google group. If you're not receiving the emails, you may have turned 
your subscription off. So just check that and check your spam folders also, because sometimes we get routed into the spam. Um, and also, um, we've been looking for a co-chair. We've had a little bit of interest in a second co-chair. Um, David Meshalam is our other co-chair. He runs Speak for the Trees in Boston, and he sends his regrets that he couldn't make it today. So um, great to see you all. Have a great spring planting season. Um, try to, you know, try to make some time for yourself in there. I know as urban foresters, planting season is really busy. And thank you all for, for what you do and for coming to the conversation today. Have a great one. Thanks, Erica. Thank you.